It's crazy. Because for me, when I just hear the word crack, it takes me back. To when Javier, when I was on the track every day trying to stack. Because I wanted money for shoes and clothes, plus for oohs and o's. So pitching poison cooked in kitchens is what I chose. But I never made it past a quarter road, though. Because it really wasn't the life I had to live. If anything, it was more for show. But I was sick sticking to them ghetto scriptures. And like paparazzi that missed, I never quite got the picture. See, I was too busy trying to rock the Richter and wild out like soccer victors while I stocked the sisters. But understand this, y'all. My pockets, they celebrated St. Patrick's Day every day. I was always keeping green in my jeans is what I'm trying to say. And Scarface and Nino Brown and Carlito, they all helped me find a way. And if I didn't have it before, oh man, it was going to be mine today. But was it all worth it? Nah, I don't think so. Is it all worth it? Uh-uh. I don't think so. You know why? Because I saw crackheads lining up for what we were winding up. And I saw mommies holding babies in their arms while they were frying up. And now those crack babies, they're crack teenagers. And if I close my eyes, sometimes I can still see their faces. Cause I see a little girl that needs help with her homework But her daddy, he's in the kitchen and he's lighting up his own work And her mommy, she's in the bathroom and she's lighting up her own work And the next day she's in trouble cause she didn't do her homework And plus, every day she goes to school hungry And the kids at school, they think it's real funny Cause her and her little brother dress bummy All this so my neck and wrist could be sunny And all this living reckless could be ugly And it bugs me, cause I wonder where she's at right now Did she make it out the life she didn't deserve somehow? Did her little brother avoid the the call the block and did her parents ever break free from the call of the rock because is it all worth it nah I don't think so is it all worth it uh uh I do not think so so now I want you to take a good look at how you're living it's how you're living life giving and community building because I know celebrities I know athletes I know killers and I know Christians and what they all got in common is young people watching and listening and I hear dudes say all the time talking crazy and it's like oh man I would die for my hood homie ah forget that I'm trying to live for my hood, cause I'll do more good with a pulse and probably see better results than if I took bullets in a fall and had an RIP mural spray painted in graffiti on the wall. So from now on, I'm gonna spend my whole life reconstructing the deconstruction, cause poverty, misery, hopelessness, and death is not young people's only function. And young people with nothing, they can end up with something. And young people with something, they can keep getting that something. So with every verse I burst, I'm trying to reverse the curse. It can only get better because I tell young people all the time that no matter who they've been hurt by and what they've been through it does not have to get any worse and I'm telling them right now to keep their grind tight and keep their grind right and keep their mind right and grow from my hindsight because is my family worth it I think so is my community worth it I think so is your community worth it I think so and are you, and you, and you, and you, and every single one of us in here worth it? Oh man, I know so. I know so. My connection with possibility came at a late, later time in my life. Because earlier in my life, as a young person, I had no vision of my future options and opportunities. I couldn't see into the future. I could only see it in the present, which was my circumstances, my environment, my experiences that I was going through growing up in, in the inner city. I had limited options, limit, perceived limited options, perceived limited opportunities, and perceived disconnection from possibility. And that ability to predict the future, it's, it's, it's like a muscle. The more you exercise that muscle, the stronger it becomes. That prefrontal cortex, as we grow uh, and the older we get, the stronger that muscle should become. And you don't really have it growing up. Like when you're little, you don't have it, so you got an excuse for doing dumb stuff, right? Like I remember I was in like four or five years old. I was in the bathroom one time, chilling or whatever. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm thinking with like my four-year-old brain, like, okay, when you take toilet paper and flush it down the toilet bowl, it like goes off to this magical, wonderful, mystical world that I'll never see or experience, and that's sad. But what's even more sad is when you flush toilet paper down the toilet bowl, it leaves all its brothers and sisters behind on the toilet roll, right? So I felt like it was my responsibility, it was my job, my duty or whatever to make sure 
Why don't I just say duty? <laughs> Make sure all that toilet paper went off to that magical, wonderful, mystical world, right? And so I, I was like, it's like a big deal. Like I start pulling all the toilet paper off and of stuffing in the toilet bowl. Pull, 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 stuff, pull, stuff, pull, stuff. Never flushing, just pulling, stuffing, pulling, stuffing. And I had it all pulled off and stuff, and it's like a celebration, right? And it's all like music in the background. I can hear it, like, you know, shampoo bottles throwing confetti or whatever, right? And it's like, dun, 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 dun. And I hit the button, it goes, nothing. The water comes up a little bit, I hit again, nothing. Then I hear my mom coming up the stairs, and your parents' footsteps always sound a lot meaner when you know you've messed up, right? <laughs> I don't know about y'all, I'm from like a real strict religious Latino family, okay? Like we used to get whooped in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like our, our belt was dipped in holy water. <laughs> My mom was famous for what we called handy whoopings. Y'all even know what a handy whooping is? Where you get whooped with whatever's handy. <laughs> like a belt, a shoe, the dog. <laughs> it's all good. And I got in trouble, you know, she came in, she saw the mess, I'm freaking out, I don't know what to do, I got like Mount St. Charmin in the toilet bowl, right? And I got in trouble. Because at age four, you can't predict the future of your actions. The older we get, the more clear our future should become. But it seems like the older a young person gets, the further we push their future away from them. And we do that in a very dangerous way, I think. And one way that we do it comes in the form of a question that we ask young people. Caring adults every day, teachers, parents, counselors, Advisors ask young people this one question that I believe is the wrong question to ask young people, and that is this. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't like that question. I don't like that question because it insinuates that you cannot be or do anything significant with your life until you grow up. Then in order to be or do something significant with your life, you have to be a grown-up, you have to be an adult, you have to be a high school or college graduate, 21 or over. It's not true. And so we push the future so far away that it becomes inconceivable. And so how do we reframe the question? How have I reframed the question with my two children? I have a 13-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. Instead of asking them, what do they want to be when they grow up? I ask them, who and what are you becoming right now? And the other problem I have with that question is the, what we equate what we want to be when we grow up is, with is, is our job, what we do for a living. I don't want to know what my children are, want to do for a living. I want to know what they want to do for a life. That's my question to you. I'm interested in what you're doing for a living, but I'm also interested, even more interested in what you're doing for a life. So I ask my children, who and what are you becoming right now in terms of your attitudes, in terms of your actions, and in terms of your aspirations? And so I had them write it down, and they hung it on their walls in their bedroom so they can see it, read it, and remember it every day. So my son is becoming more focused right now. My uh, son is becoming better at math right now. He's becoming a better football player right now. He's becoming better at keeping his room clean right now. My daughter is becoming um, a better reader right now. She's becoming better at making her bed. She's becoming a veterinarian right now. Now, she's 10 years old. Does that mean she's in veterinary school? No. But what does it mean? Now that I know that, I can take her to the zoo, I can take her to the veterinarian's office, I can buy her books, I can get her DVDs, show her stuff on the computer, she's got this amazing imagination, she plays with her stuffed animals, she does veterinary stuff with them, and I went in her room the other day and she had like a cat with crutches and like a turtle on dialysis and a dog with one of those voice tracheotomy things like arf, 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 arf. It's crazy. And she might change her mind a hundred times between now and her 18th birthday, and I'm okay with that. When she go, and incidentally, you ask my daughter what grade she's in, she's not going to tell you she's in the fourth grade. She's going to say, I'm in the class of 2022. Because she understands that right now, she is on a trajectory to become a class of 2022 high school graduate, college incoming freshman. She's got her Yale pennant hanging on her wall. She's becoming these things right now, and she understands now we can have a conversation about the choices she needs to make right now to become those things right now. My question to you is who and what are you becoming right now in terms of your, of your actions, in terms of your attitudes, in terms of your aspirations? And my challenge to you is to define yourself and don't let anyone else define who you are because I promise you, if you don't define you, someone else will. And most likely, it won't be for your benefit. Most likely, it'll be for their benefit. Most likely, it'll be so that they can exploit you or capitalize on you. And so this is your moment to connect with possibility. 
This is your moment to define yourself instead of letting someone else do that for you. So come hear my people. Come and hear my people. I didn't come to preach. I came to hear my people. Because when I hear my people becoming POWs and MIAs, that's prisoners of words and missing in action. It makes me pray, oh God, can we please add a lesson to this day? Learn this. Every single word that comes out of your mouth to or about someone is pushing them one step closer to life or one step closer to death. So recognize the power and potential of every word that's carried on your breath. And know this, no one can make you feel inferior. You have to give them permission. So understand where their hate and their venom is really coming from. It is a simple-minded suggestion designed to distract and detour you from your mission. And if seeing is believing, then nothing should be clearer. Just force yourself to see beauty, power, intelligence, and strength every time you look in the mirror. And anything special you think you see in me is really just a reflection of your own specialness, your own greatness, your own amazingness, and your own energy. See, I am just blessed to be standing up here basking in the light of your presence because your presence is a present that can only be given to this world when you are physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally present. So understand, my people, I want you to learn this lesson. And more importantly, my people, into your heart, I want you to burn this lesson. Understand, my people, I want you to hear this lesson clearly. See, every single one of you is valuable and necessary. Understand, my people, I want you to feel this lesson clearly. Every single one of you is valuable and necessary. Understand, my people, I want you to live this lesson clearly. Every single one of you is valuable and necessary. Now help me out, my people, and share this lesson clearly. If we want to see other people connect to their possibility, it starts here, and then we take it out of here into this country, into this world, by sharing that message that every single one of us is valuable and necessary. But let's practice right here and now to tell, by telling each person around you, in front of you, behind you, beside you, tell all the people around them right now that they are valuable and necessary. Remind them how valuable and necessary they are. You are valuable and necessary. You are valuable and necessary. You're valuable and necessary. You're valuable and necessary. You're valuable and necessary. Every single one of us are valuable and necessary. And when we realize our significance, we realize the significance of every choice that we make. When a young person is going through school, is going through life, period. They are on a search for significance. We all are. And they, we will find that significance in the connection that we have with others and the connection to our opportunity to create chances and possibilities for ourselves. I remember this one time, we were at a family reunion. My son was about three years old. He couldn't swim. They had an in-ground swimming pool. We didn't know that at the time when we went. And so he, we go there, and I let him stand like on the handrail where the water was just above his ankles. And he's standing there holding on to the rail. He's like splashing around his feet or whatever. And I'm watching him, standing right beside him watching. And after a while, he got a little more confident, and he took that next step down where the water was like just above his knees. And I'm watching him, but he's still like splashing around and everything, just kicking his feet, watching his cousins play in the water. And after a while, he got real confident and wanted to connect with the possibility of going even further into that water. And before I had a chance to stop him, he took that third step <laughs> into the abyss of no return, right? He's gone. I jump up, I snatch him out of the water. Quick, he's coughing, spitting, crying, everything. I'm holding on to him. I'm like, it's okay, buddy. You took a chance. I'm just glad you took a chance. You took a chance. I'm okay. You're okay, buddy. You're okay. And I'm, you know, he's all panicked, right? And he goes to his mother, and his mother holds him for a few minutes, gets him all calmed down or whatever. And then after a while, he comes back over. He's like, Daddy, take my hand. I was like, okay, buddy, what's going on? He said, I want to took a chance again. <laughs> <laughs> In life, when you are connecting with possibility, we are sometimes stepping into uncertain waters that we don't know what's going to, and we don't know what's going to happen. But the important thing is that we take that step, and when we do, reach out to those we're connected to and be willing to reach out and connect with others as they take that step into those uncertain waters. So as we continue to challenge ourselves to connect with possibility, I challenge you to keep taking chances. Thank you.